So now let's welcome our guest speaker, Aspen. Hello. Okay. So, hi, I'm Espen. I'd like to thank the YA Big Clubhouse for inviting me. And I'll be talking about uh, the program I'm going to host this summer, uh, the math reading program. Uh, first off, I'll send a link to the interest form. Um, and fill, if you're interested in taking the class, you should fill that out by Saturday, tomorrow, basically, uh, so that we can judge what time to schedule the, the class. So I'm Aspen, if you don't know me, I have been teaching at YA for a few years, um, and I've I've have teaching experience from elsewhere as well. I've been uh, teaching at the Berkeley Math Circle since 2018. Uh, I've been teaching college and math topics there uh, to high school and middle school students in the advanced group, and I also do competitions. I do Olympiads, so I've been. So I received uh, honorable mention in the 2020 USA Math Olympiad, and I qualified for MOP through that. And I also participated in the Physics Olympiads and the Computing Olympiad. Uh, I also am have been a math USA research I'm MIT Primes USA research intern for a while, and I've published uh, research papers uh, in a journal. And so I've also won scholarships. Uh, such as the Caroline D. Bradley Scholarship and the Spirit of Ramanujan uh, Scholarship. So, as you can tell, I love teaching. I love teaching math. And in particular, I think one of the great skills that one can have in mathematics is the ability to pick up a text and read it through. Uh, and delve deeply into the topics discussed by the text and solidify what you know about a subject by reading it. And so that's what the program I'll be hosting is about. The math reading program, in it, I'll be having getting high school and middle school students to go beyond the level that you would normally have in competition math to engage with mathematics in more depth than otherwise available. Um, students, I, every every week before class, students will work through assigned material and um, try to understand it. And we'll have weekly discussion sections, uh, sessions where we discuss what we learn from the material and any questions and also the problems in the material. And, um, in this way, uh, we're going to have students not only solidify their learning, solidify what they learn, but also uh, develop the skills that they need to be able to uh, do ma read math by themselves, to pursue the pursue the bounds of mathematics, uh, which can be useful for several future skills. For example. Uh, doing math or science later on in life, or even researching it yourself. Um, and so for the rest of this talk, I'll be talking about what I want, uh, what the topic is going to be for the, the math reading program this summer. And so let's get started with that. So let's... Okay, uh, so can everyone see the screen? Uh, you can use the chat. Okay, cool. So what I'm writing as well. Okay. So the topic for this uh, summer will be Abel's irreducibility theorem. Uh, what that says 
I'm sure you all know the quadratic formula that says that for equations of the form ax squared plus bx plus c uh, equals zero, we can find a root to this equation given by an explicit formula. Uh, I'll write down the formula here. So this formula, okay, I should make that bigger. So this formula gives you uh, the root of a quadratic polynomial, right? And we're gonna be looking at not only quadratic polynomials, but polynomials of higher degree. So a cubic polynomial has degree three. Uh, and there is indeed a cubic formula. Um, if you search that up right now in Google Images, you'll see some rather big expression. And it does give the root of uh, a cubic. And x to the four, for quartic polynomials, polynomials of degree four, you can also get a quartic formula, which is very, 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 very big. But the point is it works. Uh, if you search up a quintic formula for polynomials of degree five, you won't find anything. And Abel's theorem uh, tells you why. It's because it's just not possible. There are quintics which have no closed solution. And so what we're going to be doing throughout the course of this class is we're going to uh, work our way up from the foundations of uh, complex numbers, right? Just knowing what they are and having some familiarity with them. We're going to work our way up from just familiarity with complex numbers and maybe uh, knowing a little bit of group theory uh, all the way up to the proof of Abel's theorem. And I hope that you guys will enjoy this journey. And I hope you come away from this class with uh, the ability to go through any text uh, and be able to un break down even the most complicated theorems into something that you can digest. So, uh, group theory is going to be the topic of the first two days of our, and uh, the first two sessions of our class. Uh, and the connection is somewhat surprising. Uh, first of all, a group is a set um, of elements and an operation on the set. I'll say star. So a group constitute, a group is a set and an operation on the set. For example, a group could be the integers and uh, with addition, or a group could be um, the real numbers uh, other than zero with multiplication. Uh, does anyone know the rules of the group? Uh, you can use the chat to answer. Like name some laws that a group must have. Uh, how about this? Um, what is associativity? Anybody willing to speak up? Like the associated um, property of math or something? Yeah. Yeah, it's basically like um, the associated property of addition and multiplication. And like, um, in addition, it's like, you know, if you have a group of numbers, you can add any two, I think any group, and then you'll still get the same sum. And I think same goes for multiplication. Yeah. So associativity for an operation, for example, addition, um, is where any order of adding numbers uh, produces the same result, right? 
Now, uh, this doesn't just apply to addition, but it also applies to, uh, it, it has to apply to any operation in a group. For example, if we look at the group, okay, here, here's an example of the group. Let's look at the group of permutations of three numbers. Uh, that's called S3. And we're going to use composition as the operation. Uh, first, let me define that. So permutations are, here's one way we can look at it. If we have a triangle with, uh, vert with vertices one, two, and three, uh, a permutation would just be any way to uh, leave and uh, rotate the triangle or reflect the triangle. For example, you could take a permutation given by uh, reflecting across this line. And the composition of two, per uh, two permutations is just what happens when you do one symmetry and then another symmetry. Uh, so if you first reflect across the line, uh, then you rotate it 120 degrees, um, starting with the triangle one, two, three. You can compose these two permutations by first reflecting across the line, uh, like two, one, three, and then rotating it so that it becomes three, two, one. And this, and this composition of permutations also satisfies the associative property in the sense that if you have three, three permutations, F, G, and H, then first doing uh, H composed with G and then doing F is the same thing as doing uh, H and then F and G composed with F. And so there are other properties of groups that groups must have. For example, uh, groups must have an identity element. And what that means is an element, uh, we'll call it E. An element E, let me erase this. So, okay, pro property one is associativity. Property two, we'll say, is that it must have an identity element such that when you use that identity on any number or any element of the group, you get the group and you get the element. Uh, so for example, what number E satisfies E plus X is always equal to X? In chat, this is a simple one, zero, yes. So the identity of addition is zero. Um, what is the ident... Okay, let's name these groups. Uh, we'll call this Z as a group and we'll call this R as a group or uh, R minus zero. So R star, that's how it's denoted. So R star, let that be R without zero and the operation is multiplication. So in R star, Uh, in R star, what satisfies that one? Okay, what satisfies E times X is X? And I just said that the answer is one because one times anything is the same thing. Um, so groups must have identities. And finally, uh, the the final property of groups is that they must have inverses and what that means is that any uh for any a you can always produce an element a prime or i'll call it b uh for any a you can produce an element b uh, such that A composed with B is equal to the identity. So let's go back to addition. What is the, given a number, let's say, let's say three. 
what number do you add with three to get the identity? This is a matter of subtraction. Uh, not quite three. Three plus three is six. Six is not the identity. Zero. Uh, zero is the identity. E minus three. That's right. But what's E? Negative three. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Three plus negative three is equal to the identity, uh, which was zero. Um, in the in R star, three times. So this is E plus. In R star, three times what? is equal to the identity. Note that uh, negative three is also called the additive inverse of three. And that's the reason why. It's the thing which you add to invert it. Um, so three times what is equal to E in R star? Remember that E in R star is one. One third, indeed. Three times one third is equal to E. Um, so that's the, those are all the laws of the group. Uh, by the way, in R star, uh, notice that I removed zero from R. So in the set of real numbers, I removed zero for the multiplication. Why did I do that? Does anyone know? What goes wrong if zero is part of the group? Yeah, you can't take the additive inverse of zero, I mean, multiplicative inverse of zero, because zero times something can never equal one. So those are the laws of groups. Uh, what hope, now, now let's talk about why, and, and, those are the laws of groups in the sense that, uh, by the way, a group, I mean, some set in an operation is a group if and only if all those laws apply. So they hold for all groups. And um, if they hold for a set in an operation, that set is a group. So let's, uh, let's talk about why groups are relevant. Um, or here. So first, let's define the commutator of two groups, or I'll just say the commutator of a group with itself. Um, so if we have a group G and some operation, if we look at the set, that was the terrible bracket. Okay, if we look at the set of everything of the form A combined with B combined with A inverse and B inverse. So A inverse and B inverse are the elements, by the way, such that A combined with A inverse is the identity. So if we look at all the elements of this form, that is going to be the commutator of uh, G with itself, which is denoted like this. Um, so first of all, a bit on the name, commutator has the same word root as com uh, commutativity. Uh, does anyone know what com uh, commutativity is? I was saying that sounds so weird. Commutativity. Yeah, uh, th that was a direct message, by the way. Um, if you want to send to everyone or not. Um, yeah, so uh, commutativity is what uh, is the property that A plus B, or really any operation, equals uh, B uh, and A. So for example, two plus three is three plus two. So addition is commutative. Uh, so com 
so if if uh, the operation is commutative, what is A combined with B combined with A inverse combined with B inverse equal to? Uh, it's looking, yeah, it's equal to the identity, right? Because these two elements, by associativity, we can um, multiply them first. And by commutativity, we can then write that this is equal to A star A inverse, star B star B inverse. And then again, by associativity, if we look at these elements only, that's E star E. And E star anything is itself, so that's just E. So that's the identity. But in non-commutative groups, groups where this does not necessarily hold, the, uh, the commutator isn't necessarily as simple as just the identity. There can be other elements in the commutator. Um, for example, what happens if you take um, the permutations on three numbers? If you take the commutator of that, uh, you get the cyclic group of order three, which I won't explain what that is. But if you take the commutator of that new group with itself, you get the identity. And this, we then call the permutations on three numbers a soluble group. You can solve it. And that's where the word comes from. And you can do the same thing with S4. Because if you take the commutator of S4 with itself, and then you keep on uh, doing that, you'll eventually get to E. So it's also a soluble group. But S5, interestingly, if you take the commutator of S5 with itself, the permutations on five numbers, you'll eventually get to uh, the a5, A5. A5 is another set of permutations that's smaller, but that keeps on going to itself. Uh, and so S5 is not soluble. And so this bizarre, obscure fact about S5, um, it's a bit out there, you know, this wasn't a very easy fact to define, but this fact, I claim is equivalent to uh, the quintic formula not existing. This says that the cubic formula does exist. This says that the quartic formula does exist, but somehow the quintic formula doesn't. And in over the course of this class, I hope to start with only something as basic as the knowledge of complex numbers and build our way up to showing that this obscure fact about uh, permutations on five numbers is equivalent to the quintic formula not existing. And I hope that I've gotten you interested in this class with that statement. It's a very beautiful proof. Uh, I like it very much. And so I want to share it. Um, and at this point, I'll, I'll take questions because there are four minutes left. If there are any questions to be had. The commutator. Um, yeah, I kind of rushed through the explanation of the commutator uh, because it's complicated. Anyway, so uh, let's let's look at an explicit example for the commutator. Um, let's see. I'll go with I'll go with the tri uh, triangle then. Actually, no. Let's go with the square. The square seems like a good choice. So this square, um, this square, we're gonna look at the symmetries of the square and the group of symmetries of the square will be called D4 or D8, depending on how you like to denote it, but I like D4 more. So D4 is the symmetries of this square and that's gonna be 
first the symmetry which leaves the square as is that's the identity and then the rotations you can rotate by 90 degrees 180 degrees one uh one and 270 degrees and then there's the reflections you can reflect horizontally you can reflect vertically you can reflect diagonally right and uh, those are the symmetries of a square. So let's look at two symmetries in particular. Say I want to look at the symmetry given by rotating 90 degrees and the symmetry given by reflecting vertically. Let's call this one A, let's call this one B. And we're going to look at um, the element produced by uh, combining A and B. Uh, so, or, or not combining them, but taking the commutator that corresponds to them. So first of all, what is the inverse of B? If we reflect a square uh, horizontally, how do we get the original thing back? Say I have a square, one, two, three, four, or I labeled that wrong, one, two, three, four, and I reflect it across this line so that it becomes, uh, let me change color, so that it becomes um, two, one, three, four, or two, one, four, three. So how do I get the original numbers back? What symmetry do I use? If I flip a square, okay, it doesn't even have to be a square. Say I take an image, right? Uh, say i took an image and i flipped it horizontally what do i do to the new image to get the original image back it's not that hard of a question flip it again yes indeed the inverse of b is b uh, because b composed with itself if I flip an image horizontally, if I flip a square horizontally, I just flip it back to get the identity, right? Uh, similar question for A. If I rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, what do I do to get the square back? Rotate it, clock rotate it clockwise, indeed. And so, uh, So A inverse is equal to this. And so what we're going to now look at is um, what happens when you take the commutator. So A, B, A inverse, B inverse is what we're looking at. So first of all, what happens uh okay i'll just do this because this is hard to ask so one two three four when we rotate that we get one two three four um after rotating it this way so that's a now we're gonna apply b So what happens when we apply B, we get three, two, four, one, or three, two, one, four. If we then apply A inverse, we get um, four, three, two, one. 
And if we finally reflect across B, we, uh, or B inverse, it's the same thing. We finally end up with three, four, one, two. Now, what element is this? How do you get from the, the original green square to the new blue square? You rotate it how many degrees? To get from green to blue. One eighty, indeed. So that means that a 180 degree rotation is going to be part of the commutator of this group. Uh, so yeah, the, the set of, in fact, if you want the, all the commutators of the group, the set of commutators is simply E and a 180 degree rotation. Uh, that's the entire commutator of D4. And so, um, and so what happened with the soluble stuff is if we take a group, if we take a group G and you take its commutator with itself to get a new group, I'll call that G1. And if we take the commutator of that with itself to get a new group, uh, to get G2 and so on. If we eventually reach the trivial group, aka the group with only one element, namely E, that group is soluble. And so the claim that we make is that S5, the group of permutations on five elements, not being soluble, is what makes there no quintic formula. In other words, if there is a cubic quartic formula, the group must be soluble, but S5 is not. And we're going to show that those facts are equivalent and then prove that uh, S5 is indeed not soluble. Any further questions? Uh, at this point, I'm also going to repost the link as a reminder that it is due by uh, Saturday tomorrow. It's just a small form. to uh, figure out what time we should schedule it. I really like the topic of this class. Uh, when I first learned it, I thought it was probably one of the most amazing pieces of mathematics I've seen because it starts from such elementary mathematics and works itself up to a theorem that sounds and is indeed very complicated to prove. So I really liked it and I want to share it. But if there are indeed no more questions, uh, that was my talk and I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll come join me in the summer. <laughs>